if you were different from just a, a white person, then you were looked at like, mm, maybe this isn't going to work out, like immediately. <laughs> for tuning in i know it's been a little minute it's been like two weeks i'm sorry it's been a little minute but i am back with another video this video is going to be pretty pretty interesting and very insightful and enlightening to me um it's it's very personal as well so i'm really excited to talk about this with you guys it's gonna get into it this video is going to be about the netflix documentary white hot the rise and fall of abercrombie and fitch so if you're ready you might want to just you know buckle your seat belts if you didn't watch it I'm giving you guys the lowdown, giving you guys what's tea with this documentary on top of the fact of disclosing a lot of information that is personal to my experience because I did work at Abercrombie & Fitch in 2012. So if you guys are ready, let's just get right into it. I know y'all see the watermarker. You see it right here? That means that you can click that and you can subscribe, okay? So subscribe to this channel. We're almost to 500 subscribers. This is such a big milestone for me in this channel. I've been working so hard for the past almost three years now on YouTube. So let's just do this. Let's do this. Let's do this together. Make sure you guys comment below. If you worked at Abercrombie & Fitch, please comment below. I cannot wait to talk to you about this, okay? If you haven't, if you just had a um, particular experience that you never forgot from Abercrombie, whether it was shopping or you had an experience with a manager or a sales associate, please don't hesitate to comment below. So let's get into the video. If you didn't watch my Crown Act video, then you might wanna watch that before you watch this. I did talk to you guys a little bit about my Abercrombie and Fitch experience in working with the company. I worked there for like seven months from 2012 to 2013. So I worked at Abercrombie. I was 18 years old. I just fresh out of high school. That was like my first job I ever had. So if you want a little bit more background about that and my story with Abercrombie, then you might want to go look at that video. I will link it below in the description of this video. So go watch that first and then come back here. Okay, don't go nowhere. Just come back. I'm going to talk about Abercrombie. And yeah, I'm going to give you guys my initial thoughts, of course, at the end. So let's just do this so the documentary on netflix is white hot that's the title white hot the rise and fall of abercrombie and fitch so from my understanding of abercrombie as today is that people don't really shop there anymore after i left the company i don't think nobody shopped there no more because at the time that i did work there it was popping like Everybody wanted the bubble jackets, especially like being in DC, like bubble coats is a thing. Every fall, winter, bubble coats is a thing. And the better quality bubble coat you can get, the better. Working up Georgetown in DC, like that was the thing, like bubble coats, Abercrombie bubble coats. Abercrombie jeans was always very expensive. I think they were like $80 a pair, but they're good quality. Um, and if you can catch them on sale, then you can get them on sale. This documentary opens up basically telling you background about Abercrombie as a company and how it started in 1800s, I believe. And it was just like a sportsman's type of store where of course only white people shop because, you know, as a brand, it's always been like predominantly white owned, white trademarked type of brand, but it was just like a sportsman's store. So it was a store where you can get hiking equipment, you can get like fishing equipment and stuff like that. It wasn't so much as like just casual clothes. So it really made that transition in the early 90s. It transitioned into a clothing brand and 
basically Abercrombie was one of the brands that trademarked themselves into just really being, you know, non-diversified. Like that was mainly one of those brands that just was a non-diversity. It was one of the main ones. It was a lot of other ones, like, of course, like um, Hollister and American Eagle and stores like that back during those times was just white. And of course, in the 90s, you know, this was before social media. So in the 90s, it was just TV, magazines, and going to the mall. Like that's, and they talk about that in the documentary as well, about how mall culture really influenced Abercrombie to grow and expand. How they did certain things with their stores that enticed people to come in and how they really used sex as a way to entice like young people to shop there. It made Abercrombie like an exclusive club that only a few people could get in or only a few people could shop or just mainly only white people could be there. Clothes were casual, ordinary, just regular, regular stuff, but it was the logo that everyone wanted. Like everyone wanted that logo. That logo symbolized being cool, fresh in college, fresh out of high school, that type of crowd, just, you know, young, cool, fit, white, you feel me? Being black growing up and watching TV, reading magazines, we wanted, like, the guest jeans. We wanted Tommy Hilfiger because the Destiny's Child was in it. Aaliyah was in it. Snoop Dogg was in Tommy Hilfiger. We wanted all of these brands that we couldn't afford, that we saw black people have on TV and you know around this time in the 90s when Abercrombie went public in 1996 that was a way for I guess them to bridge the gap between affordable and non-affordable everyone wanted guest jeans but nobody could afford that and Abercrombie kind of came in the middle made it they made their clothes high enough so that everybody couldn't afford it but they made it low enough so that certain people or working middle class or whatever you call it white collar people white people could afford it basically regular white people could afford abercrombie but everybody else really couldn't and if you did you had to save up your money for it and you was wearing whatever you wore over and over again mike jeffries was the ceo of abercrombie from 1996 to 2015 he definitely influenced the brand into it being non-diversified like that was his idea basically just you know bringing in that that white energy of you know you can't sit with us you can't wear the clothes he had this obsession with all american and all american even just 10 years ago just meant all white and that's just a very you know um blind way of looking at the world is if that's what you really think America looks like then you're not clearly you're not verse. Mike Jeffries really took Abercrombie in that direction of implementing you know dress policy and hair policy just the look policy in general. Firing and hiring procedures was his idea and really it was a job based on looks. You survived in the company based off of what the company thought you looked like and their perception of what beauty was. And to them, beauty, it had everything to do with facial structure as well as race and hair texture. It had everything to do with the details that make up each person, which is very, very racist and if you had a lot of details or facial structure that was not of a white man or of a white woman, even if you were plain looking, you could still survive in the company longer than someone that is black and that has curly hair or is um, thick, you know what I mean? Your ethnicity, your hair texture, your complexion, your nose shape, lip shape, all of that depended on your survival in the company. In the 90s, I'm sure all of you guys have heard of Les Wexner. He was the, or he still is, as far as I know. He owned, at the time he owned Abercrombie before it went public, and then he brought Mike Jeffries in to help him with Abercrombie. 
And Mike Jeffries, he, before he worked at Abercrombie, he was working at a woman's department store or regular store, and it was a failed store. Like, it didn't survive. So that probably personified, you know, what would happen later with Abercrombie, but experience, I guess. Some experience is better than none. So... Les Wexner, he owned Abercrombie, Victoria's Secret, The Limited, I remember The Limited, uh, Express, and Bath and Body Works. So he still owns those companies now, but he owned Abercrombie back then before it went public. He brought Mike Jeffries in, and then that's when Mike Jeffries became the CEO of Abercrombie. You know who Les Wexner is. I'll tell you about that later. The Abercrombie Way was basically natural american and classic so a classic just classic white it had nothing to do with you uh being anything other than white if you were different from just a, a white person then you were looked at like mm, maybe this isn't gonna work out like immediately a couple of things that abercrombie started to do that were cringy from this documentary was that they started making graphic t-shirts and these graphic t-shirts had slogans on it and they were very racist so not only are you doing advertisement and photos of just cool white kids in high school, those were Abercrombie and Fitch, like the vibes that Abercrombie and Fitch were going for. So that means natural American and classic. Those were like the look, the look policy, basically. So if you didn't fit that, then you weren't, you were already going to be looked at a certain type of way. Graphic t-shirts that said things about Asian people. And I think one of them said something, you know, it was just racist things. So Asian Americans, of course, started to protest about the t-shirts and Abercrombie's response was that they thought that the Asian people would like the t-shirts. Um, and I don't even know how they printed that and like, send it off to the stores because it was just bad it was like really really bad taste it's just disgusting make matters worse managers and stores they had to hire and fire based off of looks which has nothing to do with your workability at all it's just based off of looks so if you look white it's skinny you know then you will work there like abercrombie didn't have extra large you know in the in the early 90s they definitely didn't have it when i was working there either so i could barely fit the clothes to be honest and i'm not even like that that thick but i was busting out of the clothes when i was there there was something else that i noticed in the documentary that i didn't notice before even just working there was that the advertisements were very i don't know if i just never seen it or i never paid too much attention to Abercrombie's ads, it's like porn. Abercrombie's ads just look like soft porn. Even the photos were like porno, like style. It's just, it's, and it's like the clothes contradicts all of that. It's like, how are you gonna make ads with naked men like all over each other and then advertise, but there's no, they don't have any clothes on. You know what I mean? Bruce Weber was the photographer of Abercrombie at the time. And he was a great photographer, but it was like, I don't, I think that went over a lot of people's heads how like porno, like really porno. And I know like when you, when you're like in your early twenties, you'd be horny, you know, that's facts. But it's like to, to shove sex, like so much sex into an advertisement for clothes is just crazy to me especially because your demographic is like 19 20 you know 18 19 20 or 17 18 19 20 year olds or even younger kids it's like this is supposed to be the cool place to shop for kids or for teenagers but it's so much sex and it's so much like porno style like images i identified a lot with this lady named carla barrientos 
Barrientos. I hope I'm saying her name right. But I really identify with her story of working at Abercrombie because mine was kind of similar. She said that she wasn't put on the schedule a lot. And that was my experience as well. She said that she was always told to like vacuum and wash the windows. And she didn't like doing it, especially all the time. And she noticed that other, uh, she noticed that no one else would have to do it each time but her. So she mentioned something to her manager about it. Like, hey, like, I don't want to wash the windows and vacuum all the time. And she said that the manager was like, but you're so good at it. Like, you're such a good window washer. She also said that she would want to swap schedules with someone else. And, you know, conveniently, that person would be, like, white. She would want to swap, like, schedules with them, and they would tell her that she couldn't do that. And that her schedule was only her schedule, and that she couldn't switch schedules with anybody, which doesn't make any sense, because every company will let you do that like they would rather you switch schedules with somebody than call out like every company does that especially nowadays so for them to like not let her switch schedules was is crazy i mean it's obvious they that they didn't want her to switch with someone that they wanted to be on the floor at the time um, to just not keep her on the floor she said after that she wasn't scheduled for two months and then she called the store and asked them, like, does she still work there? And they said she does. And then she would have to call. Like, what? Like, what? Then another instance was a specific Abercrombie location had a lot of Asian American employees around Christmas time. And a letter got sent to the store. And they said, the basically the letter said, if you're not on this list, then you're you're being let go. And then it says season's greetings. And almost everybody got fired. And almost everybody was Asian. And one of the workers actually went and asked, like, why, like, what's going on? And the manager told them, like, hey, like, they said that there's too many Asian people working here. So I said he came there and asked like what's going on and they told him like you're it's too many of you guys here which is how do you get fired because of your ethnicity? Like that on doesn't just doesn't make any sense. Then quickly after that um, Abercrombie was sued by a lot of the employees. Um, t um, one of those, Carla, she was in the lawsuit as well. And a lot of the employees were either Black, Asian, or Spanish. And they all were suing Abercrombie because of their treatment and them being discriminated against because of their races. There was video evidence of... Um, like Abercrombie specifically keeping Asian black people and Spanish people down in the stock room on purpose because they didn't want them on the sales floor. And I thought that was crazy because I was in the stock room a lot and I didn't see nothing wrong with it only because I liked doing the stock work. But now that I think about it, I'm like, damn, like, they did that on purpose. Like they purposefully put me down there because they didn't want me to be on the floor. And you know, when you think about it like that, it's like, wow. Like I identify so much with the stories that I heard in this documentary. So it was very enlightening for me. And it also just made me sad because this was just 10 years ago that I was working there. And I can't, I can't understand for the life of me how, like, people can get away with treating people like this. And I felt like it was harassment. Like, they would always ask me about my hair or ask me to do something different with it. Or I always felt like I had to have a perm when I was there because 
I didn't want them to say anything about my hair if it wasn't permed or anything. Okay guys, so I'm gonna end the video right here. We're gonna do this in a part two. I'm gonna finish it off in a part two because this video has gotten pretty long. So if you guys like this part one, make sure that you like, comment down below and subscribe to this channel. You don't wanna miss part two, all right? I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.